Uncollected Letter by Michael Sisko. I met Dr. through a mutual friend. I had been warned that he was a crank, and since I then considered myself an expert on cranks and a potential crank myself, I went to see him. He held to his views with unusually quiet tenacity, and this was the real cause of his ostracism from the so-called medical community. He was completely unrepresented in print, having published nothing, whether regarding his idea or otherwise. He was banished only because his colleagues felt that he was not entirely in agreement with them on some vaguely defined but fundamental point. Often only the suggestion of principal disagreement is enough. Suddenly an unbridgeable gap opens between the one and the others, and he must either disappear or become a novelty. Dr. had family in Brazil, and so he moved there. He kept his pearl in its shell. I had gone to Brazil to attend a forum on medicinal plants, and this mutual friend, who was an herbalist like me, suggested that I stay with Dr. I wrote to him, and he agreed to put me up. He was completely unlike anyone I had ever met, and now I understand why. At the time, I was tempted to say that his self-mastery was inhuman, although, in fact, this turned out to be the most human thing about him. He was highly energetic. He practically didn't sleep, and yet he never ate. He drank only water. I won't go on at length. It should be obvious by now that he eventually decided to tell me his idea. He spoke to me tersely did not permit me to interrupt, and refused to discuss it once he had told me. He said that food was an unnecessary aberration, and that human beings could live without digestive organs. He said that water was the only physical nutrient we require, and that whatever energy we need is actually provided for us by the environment, more or less through the air, through the force of living things all around us. He said that fossil records show that animals originally had solid bodies without digestive systems. He said that digestive organs were parasites, which created a redundant need for food so as to bleed organic material of its living force, that Almost all animals, and of course people as well, were hosts to these parasites. He said that when we die and our bodies decompose, it is the digestive tract that rots most rapidly, and this causes the entire body to rot more rapidly, and it is from this accelerated and contaminated decomposition, contaminated with the germ of the parasites, that more parasites develop. These germs permeate the environment and target fetal tissue in particular, so as to develop along with the fetus being integrated into the tissue from the start. This also makes a rejection reaction less likely. He also told me that these parasites have an extraterrestrial origin and that they were brought to Earth deliberately. The next to last thing he told me was, when they decompose, they fulfill their purpose. He did not look at me. He told me that he expected me to doubt him. He told me that if I had any respect for him at all, I would go into the jungle to a particular place. He said that in remote places, these parasites were not sufficiently widespread and further distribution was needed. He left the room in a deep depression and withdrew from me completely. I remained 
for a few days. I was completely alone. I had no one to speak to, no one who understood English. His words ran through my head again and again of their own accord. I decided to go to the place he had described. The journey was not difficult. I asked the local people as best I could about the place, and they said it would present no particular difficulty getting there. The jungle was not especially dense in that area. I would not even require a guide. The map had given me was very detailed. No one I spoke to had ever been there, however. I went alone. After a few days I found the spot, I saw a completely foreign building rise from the breast of a hill, very plain, very openly sitting there. It was made of a thin metallic substance and was approximately the size of a large house, a little over ten feet in height. Although the jungle floor was uneven, it lay flat on the ground like a silver ingot. There were a number of randomly placed skylights, and these seemed more attractive to me than the doors. I climbed into the branches of an overhanging tree and looked down into the building. I saw two of something. They were the extraterrestrials I had talked about. They were doing the further distribution he had described to me. There was a Tupi woman lying on her face in the center of the room on an inclined table that raised her posterior above the level of her head. She appeared to be partially anesthetized, delirious but still conscious. A vertical, eye-shaped metal retainer held her buttocks apart, and I could see that she had no anus. Her legs hung down over the edge of the table and were held apart by a cone-shaped stone block on the floor. They wheeled something up behind her. It appeared to be a metal container with a long shelf protruding from its rim like an ironing board. This was brought up level with the edge of the table, where the, bed, where the base of the eye-shaped retainer slotted into a notch at the end of the shelf. They opened the lid of the container, and I could see something coiled in a thick liquid medium inside. One of them reached inside and began pulling it out onto the shelf. It was a pallid, yellow-white, too, but with a palpating mouth, like a monster hollow worm, it emerged, coil by coil, from the container. After a few minutes, I recognized what it was. The other had been applying a reddish jelly to the spot where I had expected to see the woman's anus. Now it seized the thing on the shelf and pressed the mouth into the jelly. The Tupi woman wailed softly. The thing ate its way into her body, disappearing rapidly inside. The stomach, liver, pancreas were collapsed. I assumed they were, would inflate to full size once they were in position. The palpitating mouth I had seen ate its way up through the solid central body cavity and up toward the trachea, as I now know, where it fused with the flesh forming a separate eating tube. The woman was making strangling noises as this happened. The small intestine was still feeding its way up into her body, and I could see it rippling as the human tissue it was displacing was absorbed and digested. The large intestine was still emerging from the container, coil by coil, in their claws, and I could see the digested tissue and a small quantity of blood dribbling out of the rectum, clouding the liquid in the, con in the container. As the large intestine was drawn in, the rectum left a thin trail of blood and clumps of tissue on the shelf. It then slid into the opening, and as it finally disappeared inside the Tupi woman's body, I could see the rectal mouth writhing against the flesh of the new anus, secreting, as I know now, 
a digestive enzyme to mix the two types of tissue. This all took place in less than 10 minutes. The 2P woman was now indistinguishable from a so-called normal human being. She now had an anus. I made my way back to town as quickly as possible. I ate next to nothing. I went directly to... and explained. He agreed to perform the procedure on me. I briefly regained consciousness immediately after the operation. I saw the floor was covered with my blood. I also saw entrails, entrails that were never my entrails, lying in the collecting pan, and I remember I had thought, even if I die, at least I am free. Two months later, when I had fully recovered, I asked to see them again. He informed me that he had burned them, but that I could see his, preserved in formaldehyde if I wished. <laughs> 